So it's a great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Professor Terry Weissman, to you. Although I've known Terry for many years and in many capacities at Illinois, it's in the context of our work together at the Humanities Research Institute, formerly IPRH, that I came to know her as a scholar and a citizen of the visual arts world. The subtitle of her 2011 book on the realisms of Berenice Abbott, Documentary Photography and Political Action, tells you much of what you need to know about the angles of vision through which Terry works. In this brilliant study, she explores the tense and tender relationships between realist aesthetics and the history of politics, driven, as she says in the introduction, by an art historical urge or necessity to trace a history of realist practices and account for all the numerous ways the term has been theorized. What we get is a sense of the uniqueness of Abbott's practice, as well as of her place in the history of photography beyond her celebrated New York work, including her science photography. In doing so, Terry not only recuperated Abbott from a certain minority status, she made her an avatar of the development and progress of the medium itself, which when I wrote that, I hadn't really thought about Hal Foster in that, in that particular location. Since her first book, Terry has continued to explore critical histories of photography as both an aesthetic and political practice in a number of edited collections that have helped to materialize the role of both women and of documentary in the context of American modernism. Across most, if not all, of her work to date, Terry has skillfully and persuasively suggested the ways in which reading photography as politics means calling attention to questions of the responsibility of spectators and the engagement of citizenship through representation. Perhaps we'll hear some trace effects of this method in her paper today, Ordinary Deviance, Humor and the Everyday in Hal Fisher's Conceptual Photographs. Please join me in welcoming Terry to the podium. Thank you, Antoinette. Um, that time at IPRH, and Tim was there too, was really one of the, um, one of my best years at Illinois. I, I loved that um, environment that you create, so thank you. Um, and thank you, Tim, also for inviting me here. Um, one of the things that, um, I one of the things that Peter said that resonated with me was like, what exactly am I gonna say <laughs> about this work? Like, how am I gonna actually add to this? And when Tim first asked me to, um, to participate in the symposium, it was really, I think, as like, a, like, I felt like my role was a little bit like, okay, I'm a, a photo historian and I'll situate this work within photography's history. And I thought, oh, I can definitely do that. Um, and then like the minute that I tried to do that, I was like, oh, oh God, <laughs> like I had like 18 million things I was like trying to bring together but the thing that kind of kept me going um, throughout, or that I realized was bringing it all together was the weird way in which I was relating to the work through my own totally neurotic Jewish identity. And so, um, which was also funny because um, it was weird to me that I was relating to this work at all um, in a certain kind of way, um, because I think I said to Tim yesterday, in a lot of ways, I think I'm like the exact wrong person to write about this. I'm like a total prude in so many ways, and which is also another kind of racist and sexist stereotype of Jewish women, and then that made me relate to the project again. So um, it's a little bit through that lens, um, weirdly, that I um, am approaching this in, in the end. Okay, so. Okay. So in 1977, the same year that Hal Fisher completed Gay Semiotics, Arthur J. Bresen Jr. produced a documentary about gay liberation, uh, about the gay liberation movement called Gay USA. The film, which compiles footage of pride parades held across the country in June 1977, though most are in San Francisco, is a dynamic and celebratory portrait of the modern LGBTQ movement four years before the devastation of the AIDS pandemic. Melissa Anderson describes the film as, quote, a radiant portrait of the homosexual agenda during a time marked by liberationist utopian zeal and ethos unmistakably reflected in this credo spotted on a banner held high in Gay USA. Down with the nuclear family, root of all sexual oppression, 
And I think a simil similar ebullience characterizes the smiling exchange between the two women pictured in the image that's up on the screen now on the left. Yet, as Anderson also points out, for all the ecstatically alive people in Gay USA, the film is inexplicably haunted by death, by a future that is unimaginable at the time of the work's release, including Brezin's own death in his mid-40s from AIDS-related illness just a decade after Gay USA was shot. Watching the film, it's hard not to wonder how many other people filmed in the documentary also don't make it past their mid-40s. Hal Fisher's gay semiotics, though made at the same moment, largely in the same place, bears the same retrospective weight, yet escapes, at least to some extent, this melancholic air. This is interesting to me, since photography is often understood as a mechanism for the production of nostalgia and melancholy. Roland Barthes' analysis of the medium and its temporal ordering, as the, that has been, accounts for much of this understanding. The moment a thing is photographed is proof of its passing and inevitable death. Or as Bart writes, with the photograph, quote, with the photograph, we enter into flat death. So if it's true, as I'm arguing, that gay semiotics somehow avoids being totally consumed by photography's melancholic baggage, then how? How does it do this? And to what effect? I think there are two or um, three, depending on how you count, um, intertwined reasons. One, Hal's engagement with photography and conceptualism, its deadpan seriousness and embrace of serial typologies. Two, its humor, including language that in its plain-faced delivery appears to make ordinary assertions, but in fact teases the viewer reader into a collision of perspectives and realities. And then three, which is a sort of subpoint of two, Fisher's practice of ironic deflation and the self-deprecating joke. In other words, his reliance on Jewish humor, which in its presumption of terribleness and suffering, perhaps counterintuitively, protects gay semiotics from photography's melancholic chattering ghost. Um, so let me go through these three um, points, starting with conceptual art. Um, Hal Fisher, uh, this is a little bit of this is in the exhibition. So Hal Fisher um, moved to San Francisco for graduate school in 1975 after receiving his BFA here at the University of Illinois. In San Francisco, Fisher met Lou Thomas, who's pictured now on the screen on in the middle, Donnelly Phillips, another artist who's on the left, and then Hal is on the right. Thomas, a conceptual photographer, made work that challenged the emotionalism and one might even say um, obsession with producing fine art in quotation marks and of being understood as a fine artist that had dominated the West Coast photography scene since the 1940s and that was practiced by people like Minor White whose image you see on the right. White thought of photography as a process through which the visual world was um, rediscovered as a source of transcendence for those willing to look. Thomas rejected this kind of spirituality, producing instead work, um, like what you see on screen on the left, sink, filling, filled, draining, drained from 1972, which documents the process um, that its title describes. Concerned with sequencing, the passage of time, and how photography can reveal underlying structures in our perception of the world, Thomas viewed photography in radically simplified terms that were informed by structuralist thought. It's an approach that drew Fisher in and introduced him um, in some ways to the West Coast conceptual art community. Eleanor Anton, whose image is now up on screen, was also part of the scene. And though she and Fisher are not usually discussed together, the comparison I think is instructive and helps me set up my bigger point about how gay, semio how gay semiotics avoids pre presenting photographs or photographic images of people always as life that um, is a death or presence inhabited by absence. And um, I would say too that um, Fisher's also work also avoids a kind of necessi uh, excessive nostalgia while still permitting a kind of looking back. 
So the work on screen, Carving, a traditional sculpture, that's the title, consists of 148 photographs that Anton daily took of herself over a 36 day period in 1972 when she went on a diet and lost 10 pounds. Each day's photographs are arranged in a vertical column with a small text panel placed beneath indicating the date and time the images were taken and her current weight. So it's a project in which Anton literally carves her own body, um, like the title implies, um, as one would carve a sculpture. And that's largely how the work has been described in the history of conceptual art. It's clever and um, witty. And as Leah Ullman points out, um, or as Leah Ullman points out, if laughter is the first natural response to, to the work, what follows is a more clouded reconsideration of what it means for a woman to alter her body in order to conform to male-defined societal ideal, or to, to a male-defined societal ideal, unquote. So by highlighting a process that chips away and removes one's own body fat, carving criticizes conventional standards of beauty and the pressure to lose weight, effectively combining feminist and conceptual art practices. Anton's work emerges then out of her own identity in some ways, and yet it is not constrained by it, much as gay semiotics emerges out of Fisher's identity, but is similarly not constrained. And in both cases, humor is key to how the work speaks about and beyond a kind of identity politics. This is important. Um, there is potentially product, there is a potentially un, I'm sorry, there is a potentially productive uncontainability in humor, which has been rather repressed in histories of conceptual art and histories of conceptual photography in particular. Heather Dyack writes, among the many antinomies that characterize the legacies of conceptual art, one of the most significant yet least explored is the tension between the use of subversive humor and a constrained analytical approach. These are not aesthetically or philosophically exclusive, but they have been branded as contradictory. The striking abundance of comedic antics in subversive twists in conceptual art makes the omission of serious discussions of the subject all the more alarming. So let me go then into a little bit of how, or examine somewhat how gay semiotics or humor in gay semiotics operates thinking on the one hand about how laughter offers a way to bring intersubjective awareness to bear on human activity, and on the other, how human functions as a kind of condition for taking up a critical position with respect to what passes for everyday life. Um, I suspect that everyone in here has seen um, the exhibition or gay semiotics, but I'm gonna just quickly, quickly run through it just to remind you um, a little, uh, what the project is. Um, that the, it analyzes, gay semiotics analyzes and deconstructs gay vernacular as it appeared on the streets of San Francisco's Castro and Haight-Ashbury neighborhoods in the 1970s. And um, it's also, I think, important to note that the project is divided into four different sections. Signifiers, and these are two sections from the section called signifiers, archetypal media images, and here are two from that section, fetishes, and street fashion. Um, each one of these, actually, there can be a lot could be said in terms of relating them to the history um, of photography. Um, so, it, sort of hold that thought in, um, in your in your mind. Also, in the project, uh, white text and sometimes arrows and diagrams that are embedded within the photograph's surface accompanies each of the twenty-four black and white images and identifies the significance of these objects and styles, um, or the objects and styles pictured. So in some images, that text is fairly brief, um, like street fashion, jock, this is that the image on the left, um, sleeveless undershirt, satin gym shorts, white socks, Adidas. In others, it's more elaborate. Archetypal media image, Western, um, or as you see in archetypal media image, Western. The Western or cowboy prototype um, is identified by 
articles of clothing, cowboy or Western boots, jeans, flannel or Western style shirts, and in some instances, hats. The cowboy represents the frontier of a male only society. The machismo qualities of the Western archetype are vigorously exploited by advertising. Modern cowboys are used by the media to play up masculinity and sexuality in ways that are subconsciously understood by the gay populace. So I'm sorry, that's me reading the text that's on there. Um, and if you had been reading this in person or uh, facing the work um, in the exhibition or looking at it um, directly, the image itself, in order to read the text, would have driven you in so that you would come into close contact with the man's um, crotch. And in fact, there are a lot of butts and crotches <laughs> in this project. Um, but I should also mention that in this image, um, because this is something really key about the work and why humor is important about how it brings a kind of materiality um, uh, to conceptual art, uh, the guy's hand uh, or his left arm functions as a kind of arrow um, that is gently situated underneath the waist of his pants, um, again, pointing us to his crotch and suggestively reminding those of us looking at this image of touch, of touching ourselves and of um, touching others. I, I made this note while Peter was talking that in a way this is like um, the, the kind of, um, this is, this is the comparison to what, just to remind you of what Tom, the Tom of Holland image makes really explicit, where the guy is just like outright grabbing his crotch. Um, and, and I also want to say um, also that, that I make a point about the, the print, that the print itself is hand done. And so um, there's, which I think is important because um, that ties the writing, which is traditionally part of a more um, you know, philosophical or, or intellectual plane, to the economy of touch um, and desire. But gay semiotics is um, often described specifically as an examination of the hanky code used to signify sexual preferences of cruising gay men in the Castro. And the image I want to focus on now for a bit is the one that's up on screen now, um, one of the first that Hal made as part of the series, um, and that's um, the blue and red handkerchiefs. So here we're confronted again with two butts, bookended by the two handkerchiefs, which I think is already kind of funny um, in and of itself. It's sort of like wholesome ass humor. Um, but then, unlike some of the stuff that Peter showed, it's wholesome. Um, but then if we want to, um, if we want to read um, the text, again, we need to get up close, forcing a confrontation with the pictured bodies. And the text on the left about the blue handkerchief reads, quote, handkerchiefs signify behavioral tendencies through both color and placement. A blue handkerchief placed on the right hip pocket serves notice that the wearer desires to play the passive role during sexual intercourse. Conversely, a blue handkerchief placed in the left hip pocket indicates that the wearer will assume the active or traditional male role during sexual content. The blue handkerchief is commonly used in the treatment of nasal congestion and in some cases holds no meaning in regard to sexual tendencies. Okay, and then on the right, red handkerchiefs are used as signifiers for behavior that is often regarded as deviant or abnormal. A red handkerchief located in the right hip pocket implies that the wearer takes the passive role in anal slash hand insertion. A red handkerchief placed in the left hip pocket suggests that the wearer plays the active role in anal hand insertion. Red handkerchiefs are also employed in the treatment of nasal discharge and in some cases have no significance in regard to sexual contact. As many have pointed out, there's something funny about having to get up close to read this text forcing an intimate physical confrontation with the sexualized content sometimes unexpectedly. The contrast between the erotically charged pictures, the deadpan style of writing, and the extended gray-toned picture, which adds a kind of lusciousness to the prints, further contributes to the humor by heightening the distinction 
between being in our bodies and recognizing that we have a body. The humor functions, in other words, by exploiting the gap between being a body and having a body between, as Simon Critchley explains, quote, the physical and metaphysical aspects of being human. He continues, what makes us laugh is the return of the physical into the metaphysical, where the pretended tragical sublimity of the human collapses into a comic ridiculousness, which is perhaps even more tragic. I came, I saw, I conked out. In Fisher's work, the erotic text physically draws the viewer close, yet that closeness, our physical confrontation with the image, we are essentially um, nose to butt when we're looking at these, which is a point I'll come back to, results in us being paradoxically and comically distanced from ourselves and to assume a critical position with regard to our own bodies. Okay, and then relatedly, there's the issue of the last sentence or the last two sentences in the caption. The blue handkerchief is commonly used in the treatment of nasal, nasal congestion and in some cases holds no meaning in regard to sexual tendencies. And then also red handkerchiefs are also employed in the treatment of nasal discharge and in some cases have no significance in regard to sexual contact. Placed at the end of the paragraphs, both of these sentences function like a punchline adding a temporal dimension to the work. When we're told a joke, we undergo, again, as Critchley explains, a particular experience of duration through repetition and digression, of time literally being stretched out like an elastic band. We know that the elastic will snap, we just don't know when, and we find that anticipation pleasurable. It snaps with the punchline, which is the sudden acceleration of time where the digressive stretching of the joke suddenly contracts into a heightened experience of the, instance, of the instant. We laugh. Viewed temporally, humorous pleasure would seem, to produce, would seem to be produced by this disjunction between duration and the instant, where we experience a renewed intensity, both the slow passing of time and its sheer evanescence. And it was sort of all um, paraphrased from, from Critchley. Um, and, and I want to just emphasize the last part of this, um, this distinction between duration and instant, because um, it could itself be a description of photography or of um, photography's ontological status. Um, the shutter's click is a kind of instant um, that comes after um, and before the slow passing of time. And so the comic timing as explanation of photography's ontology perhaps is almost like another joke embedded within Fisher's work. But the overt punchline, the thought that snaps this elastic essentially is, um, you know, yeah, 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 I'm mapping out this whole discourse and the structuralism, um, the discourse of structuralism onto the visual codes of queer life in the Castro, and oh, by the way, all of it might actually mean nothing, um, which is pretty funny. And there is also a kind of political force in that undoing. Like, who's the criminal here um, in a project that is ostensibly about the identification of gay signifiers? What does it mean to say that it could, in fact, all mean absolutely nothing? Who's gay? And then how can we ever know what anything means? I'm interested in these last these sentences that I've repeated um, for another reason as well, though, um, and that's for how the mention of congestion and nasal discharge um, call attention to the nose, or specifically a runny nose. When Fisher talks about gay semiotics, he often talks about or refers to the project's underlying Jewish humor. In a 2015 interview with art historian Julia Bryan Wilson, for instance, asked about um, where the image that's now on screen on the right um, was taken, an image that, that Brian Wilson describes as funny um, for how the submissive leather figure sits un um, incongruously on cardboard boxes in what looks like an office, Fisher responds, those pictures were taken at the trading post, which was an s and emporium, and it was very makeshift in those days. It wasn't the industry it is today. Um, and then Brian Wilson follows up, 
somewhat sarcastically, I'm sure, um, queer sex accessories weren't coming from a polished manufacturing industry. And Fisher, no. Um, and I certainly didn't own that kind of stuff. And I don't know if the work is actually self-deprecating, but there is certainly a level of Jewish humor underscoring this. So the s and figure, who appears totally out of place and somewhat pathetic in the makeshift office, and the congested running nose that, require, that requires a handkerchief, these qualities, I would say, um, involve a level of self-mockery characteristic of Jewish humor, where the joke's narrator is the butt of his story. And also, importantly, um, the figure with whom the audience really um, can easily identify. And for sure, I think some of the what I would call quirky relatability, um, the calling attention, uh, it, it, sorry, some of the gay semiotics is quirky um, relatability comes from calling attention to um, the body's foibles and also prevents it from falling into this kind of irretrievable melancholic past. But Jewish humor is not merely self-criticism, it's also self-justification sometimes accompanied, often accompanied, with a sense of superiority. Or as Sarah uh, Blacker Cohen describes, Jewish humor exists, quote, in a state of constant tension between criticism and justification. If you extend the narrator's self-deprecating remark a little bit, it becomes a sardonic comment, not merely on the plight of the Jews, but also on the plight of all humanity, unquote. So the narrator, here in gay semiotics, the kind of nebbishy guy who, after describing the gay semiotics of the red and blue handkerchiefs, points out that actually maybe none of it, none of what he said is true, and that maybe the handkerchiefs are just used for blowing noses, undercuts the certainty of the signifiers he's defined, thereby pointing to the arbitrariness of the sign and his own cleverness. So then, nose to butt the viewer is left, what I would say, the viewer is left smelling the work's physicality, its eroticism, and also its intellectualism. Um, in other words, we're having our nose rubbed in it, and in a manner that is resolutely unsentimental, fitting to the work's cool conceptual aesthetic. Okay, so um, I know in a way I'm asking you to hold a lot of balls in the air, but I want to... Um, ask you to hold on to the thoughts about Jewish humor for a moment while I return to, um, or briefly return to Anton's carving piece in order to think about uh, a little bit further this cool conceptual aesthetic that I just mentioned. When I spoke earlier about Anton's work, uh, what I didn't describe is how, in addition to feminist politics, um, the work also provides insight into photography's long history of recording, measuring, and assessing the body. Although a performance-based conceptual work, much of the piece's success um, stems from the particular way that Anton made herself the object of the camera's penetrating lens. Arranged in a giant grid, each photograph features Anton standing somewhat awkwardly against the same white door in approximately the same place. The repetition of the door and also um, the door frame, the lock, the handle, and so on, furnishes a constant against which the viewer can measure and evaluate Anton's changing body. The consistency of the framing and purposeful administrative as opposed to artsy look of the images, think for instance of how the photographs are simply tacked to the wall or how they resemble medical documentation, thus connects Anton's photographic approach to systems of measurement and control, as well as to pseudoscientific studies of the body such as those in 19th century ethnographic image, imagery, which were explicitly designed to control, um, dominate, and rule populations. Such references are um, not uncommon in conceptual photography. And um, Fisher working in the Bay Area in the 1970s would have seen a fair amount of it, or if he didn't see it, it was certainly around. And gay semiotics should be seen at least in part about the history of photography's long legacy of ethnographic typing. Um, okay, so again, keeping all of this stuff kind of floating in your head um, or juggling around, 
I want to introduce one more figure with regard to this issue of ethnographic typing, and that's August Zonder, whose image you see um, on the left, um, because I think Zonder lingers behind Fisher's project. Just looking at the two images together, in fact, I hope you can see certain parallels, um, such as the central framing, um, the, um, the clarity of the printing, and also the self-posing and the lack of any costumed elements. Sander began work on his project in the 1920s in Germany and conceptualized the project as a visual accounting of all of the different people that made up Germany's democratic society. Though he began the project, uh, which was titled Citizens of the 20th Century, during the years of the Weimar Republic, he continued to work on it despite enormous obstacles until his death in 1964. Though the project was never completed, the plan was to create a series of books that contained portraits of hundreds of German citizens, um, images that would be organized according to profession and social class with categories such as peasants and far farm laborers, skilled laborers, bankers and merchants, aristocrats, women, and intellectuals. And then the book also included a section uh, or included marginalized populations in categories such as the insane and beggars. So that's also a little bit of why I emphasized at the beginning that um, in uh, gay semiotics there are these four very clear classifications in some ways uh, that mirrors um, some of what Zonder is also doing. Um, the two projects, Zonder and Fisher's, like other ethnographic projects, also share a remarkably similar mode of, rec of presentation. Most of the photographs feature a single figure in a work setting or living situation centered in the frame and displayed um, full body or three quarters length view. The expression on the man and pastry chef, straightforward and serious, is typical of Sander's approach. The camera confronts the subject directly and the subject rarely if ever smiles back. On its own, Pastry Chef would be a compelling portrait. Extraordinarily crisp, again, as is typical of Sandra's work, the chef's white jacket and his silver mixing bowl, a tool of the trade, glows against the kitchen's darker grays. But situated in Sandra's larger archive of Weimar types, um, again, this, pro this whole uh, Sandra's project at one point consisted of tens of thousands of images. So seen within this larger archive, the image ceases to portray any specific individual and instead comes to represent part of a social collective. Or really, and this is one of the key contradictions embedded within the project, you could say that Sonder explored photography's capacity to render the specificity of an individual as an ostensible universal type. Um, two more examples are on the screen now, one from citizens and, and one from gay semiotics. So a lot more could be said about how Zonder's photographic project relates to Fisher's, but as I um, start to draw uh, to an end here, I wanna try to put things together by focusing on the context out of which both projects emerged and how that context continues to drive the work's meaning. Life um, consorts with death in both, but to different effect. So in Saunders' case, the Citizens Project was inseparable from Weimar, that brief democratic moment in Germany between World War I and II, marked on the one hand by an extraordinary cultural renaissance and on the other by economic turmoil, hyperinflation, and political extremism that plagued the Republic, creating the chaotic conditions that culminated in Hitler's rise to power in 1933. Indeed, in the summer of 1934, the Nazi Ministry of Culture ordered the seizure of Sonder's work, destroying thousands of his plates and negatives. Now, on the surface, Sonder's work might seem like exactly the kind of classification project um, that the Nazis might love. His rejection of the singular bourgeois portrait designed to glorify wealthy individuals and his attempt, and in, and his attempt to create a kind of new portraiture structured around collectivity and class identity, made the work an unwelcome reminder of a past German democratic society, a memory best eradicated by destroying its visual remains. 
And one of the interesting things about Saunders' project is how much it was and continues to be shaped by its, mom by its moment and how much scholars really admire the project because of its historical, not just its historical placement, but also its destruction. Um, it exists as a remnant and a reminder um, full of melancholy and mournful foreboding. Once asked about how gay semiotics fit within a history of ethnographic typing, Fisher responded by bringing up Sonder. Quote, I mean, I loved, in big caps, Sonder, he said. I still do. He then added, um, and now here, start to think back to the discussion of Jewish humor. Um, so he added, quote, I probably was a fascist in an earlier life because I'm definitely into types. I'm def and I'm definitely into archetyping. I don't really think it's that awful of a thing to do. It can be very informative. This wisecrack about being a fascist in another life goes unremarked upon in the interview, perhaps unsurprisingly. Um, and I know the person who, was, who conducted that interview, so it made me doubly laugh when I read it. Um, but it's, it's a funny and provocative statement. Um, but it's also dipped just a little bit in tragedy. And I want to suggest that the line is not simply a one-off, that beneath this wisecrack is a sense of history and also a helplessness within that history. Like the narrator who is the butt of his own joke, this characterizes Jewish humor. The wry comment or homey realism present in Jewish humor can suggest a less melodramatic, less apocalyptic perspective on even the most disquieting state of affairs of the modern world. Jewish humor, writes Robert Alter, quote, typically drains the charge of cosmic significance from suffering by grounding it in a world of homey practical realities. Um, if you want to forget your troubles, runs a Yiddish proverb, put on a shoe that's too tight. It's actually a proverb I grew, I grew up hearing in my family. Like Weimar for Sonder, the context within which Fisher worked, that brief period after Stonewall and before the AIDS crisis, has shaped much of the work's reception. And absolutely, one of the painful privileges of retrospective viewing is having knowledge of a past that, to the person you're seeing or watching or reading about, is an unfathomable future. Yet Fisher's conceptual approach to the photographic medium his deadpan delivery in both image and humorous text prevents the work from resting solely in a melancholic space that might temporarily be described as this will have been death. The subtle reliance on Jewish humor in, in particular wards off future tragedy in a manner that isn't so clearly present in a contemporaneous work like Gay USA, um, which I want to say I should, I, I totally endorse and love and find quite moving and recommend you watch it if, it, if you have um, Amazon Prime. One of the pleasures of gay semiotics, and I was actually thinking about this when you asked your question, because it's a way of thinking about pleasure totally outside of like the body in a certain kind of way. One of the pleasures of gay semiotics is the way in which it manages to draw an affinity between those pictured and those looking at the work with a seeming awareness on the part of all involved that in real life, such an affinity probably wouldn't have existed. San Francisco, the Castro, gay men, gay white men, even particularly Hal's gay white friends. This is a very specific group. And yet in the project's everydayness, in its humor, in the way it performs an allegiance between laughter and thought um, that generously encourages viewers to see across difference gay semiotics embraces an ordinary deviance that defies the limits of identity politics. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. That was, that was fabulous. Another fabulous paper. I am extremely happy in, and feel extremely vindicated in the people I invited to this <laughs> symposium. You are doing me proud. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I was struck by the dialectic, sort of tragic, comic dialectic in the paper. And you connected that through Simon Critchley to the relationship between duration and instant in photography. And so I was sort of trying to think about 
um, but as a kind of tragic conception of photography, Hal as a kind of comic conception of photography and trying to think about the relationship between duration and instant and history and at different scales of temporality, which I think is also partly what Peter was talking about. Do you want to say? Yeah, I mean, the person that's, that's lingering behind there, but I haven't worked it out yet, is Ariella Azulai, mm. who talks about the instant. Um, and, and the click of the shutter in terms of uh, colonialism. Um, and But I think it applies here somehow and um, exactly with that tragic comic kind of thing. So yes, absolutely, that's like the, the play. And, and even more so than Bart for me. I mean, Bart is someone who I was sort of going to because Hal talks about Bart all the time um, because of when he was making the work. Thank you. I'm. Do you have a remark, Hal? Do you want to? Okay. Okay. <laughs> a hoarding project is occurring before our eyes. Questions, comments. <laughs> Clearly, we will go. The questioners will ask their questions in identical order after every presentation. <laughs> Jeannie, Thank you. I really loved your talk. I found it really fascinating, in part because I had been reading the last sentence um, of the blue and red handkerchief and these other kind of qualifications quite a bit differently. Um, because for me, part of what it also suggests is the possibility not just of awkwardness or misunderstanding or the kind of humorous sort of depletion of the sort of certainty and abstraction of the science system, it does introduce the possibility of violence, right? To misread the semiotic code, to grab an ass that in no way intended for you to do it, or to assume that a practice might be possible when it wasn't, um, to, to misread has really profound stakes. Um, hence the origin of the code as a way of signaling without signaling, um, of being in a public space and allowing desire to circulate, but, but also kind of always having a kind of hedge or a, a possibility there. So I wanted to ask you about the relationship between humorous depletion, awkwardness and misunderstanding, and then this kind of threat of, in fact, being in a public space and getting it wrong and thus exposing your body to a very different kind of physical relationship. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm aware of that, um, so thank you for bringing it up. And I don't, um, I don't really know if I have anything more to say about it at this point. I mean, other than like, yeah, it's like something that will have to be addressed, you know, because in a way I looked at the whole, pro like, I was so focused on the humor and tragedy of um, like thinking about tragedy and violence in terms more historically of like the Holocaust um, and how, I mean like even at dinner last night when Hal was talking about how, <laughs> like these German symbols and then, I mean, I was almost laughing at myself in this talk, like, oh, yes, of course, here I have to, can't not talk about fascism, you know, or even when I teach the history of photography, I'm like, and then here's another project that was destroyed by the, by the Nazis, and oh, here's another one, like, I, I'm, I can be, like, my own thinking can be overdetermined by that. So the violence that you're pointing out, I think, can be made to, is part of it too somehow, but I don't know yet how. Um, but I also think it is, you know, that's one of the ways in which, I mean, the whole project undoes itself. So by having that kind of, um, I don't know how to finish that thought, Never mind. Anyway, good point that needs to be addressed. I have to now start to argue against my own point. To me, what's interesting and maybe like meta funny or meta ironic about it then is that it could both mean a kind of disappointing erotic encounter, right? The handkerchief did not mean what I thought it meant, so we're in fact not gonna go home yeah, yeah, together yeah. and do what I want. Right. 
or I could misread it and you could assault me because, right? So it could be both of those things. And that tension between like the, the levity and the gravity of potential outcomes, right? Awkwardness on the one hand, violence on the other. It just shows that those sort of public crossings um, and relations have themselves a kind of range of possible tones that you can't know in advance. So maybe that's also part of the irony of that kind of undercutting moment in the last sentence. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for answering your own question. And, and then, <laughs> it, it was really interesting to think with. Thank you. Yeah, but also it's like the gravity of levity like throughout is also part of it. I also just want to register in response to this, and I've always thought this about Hal's, I've always thought this about Hal's work and about the hanky code. It does require you to be able to reliably distinguish left from right. And many gay men are directionally challenged. I speak from experience. And so just, one doesn't need to not only know what the hanky means, one needs to know, okay, is that the right from my perspective, the right from <laughs> his perspective, which is right, which is left, is it the other left? Yeah, that's, funny. that's my version of gay Jewish humor is. <laughs> <laughs> Question from Janice Harrington. I, I don't have a question, um, just just a comment, really. It, it's sometimes nice to know what, what falls off the shelf in people's heads while you're yeah. thinking. And you were talking about those pictures in, in terms of death and absence and presence. And there's an African folk tale that no one is, a man is never dead until he's forgotten. And so in a sense, these pictures are here, and by virtue of that, still alive. And I, that that that's what I thought about, and that you know, folktale being folktales being a kind of story, and the storytelling that that you're talking about going on in those pictures. Not a question, just a comment. Yeah, that's really. Um, uh, I should probably just be like, thank you. you. Really, that's useful. But but now I'm gonna get myself in trouble by responding just quickly, which is. So what I was sort of trying to say a little bit, though, is that right, that is how photography is often read um, in, the way that you, in the way that you heard it, um, especially images of people and especially something like Zondra's project. Like, there's just uh, there's a death that's already implied in it. This will have been death no matter when. That's sort of like Bart's position. And so your comment applies to that. But then what I'm sort of arguing is that, like, weirdly, Hal's images somehow avoid that. That, that they somehow avoid that. So, um, well, I'm just going to say that for now. But anyway. Question from Christopher Kemp. Thank you for that uh, really excellent talk. I was struck by your pairings of the photographs, including here, the two and the two. Uh, and the last slide you showed of the, um, I think it was 40s trash, 40 street trash, and um, the gross of that one, the, oh, yeah. that one, the grid behind both of them. Yeah. The, uh, um, th this is, a, do you see this kind of form, formal self reflexivity uh, in the traditions of the two, two traditions you're mentioning here, Jewish humor and documentary photography? That kind of, so this is like encoding itself as a classificatory project, right? Um, is that, does that come out of those traditions you were documenting here? Say, say, the, say the question again. Does that, does this kind of formal reflexivity come out of the traditions of like uh, Jewish humor and uh, documentary uh, ethnography, photography? So yes to the ethno ethnographic question, 100%. And I mean, and it's so, um, there are so many like parallels you could kind of make in these images. I hadn't really thought about that as a quality of Jewish humor, but I love that idea because then it doesn't just rely on me having to hear like that Hal talks about fantasizing about being a fascist, <laughs> but then it's, a, I'm not saying that you do. <laughs> you do. <laughs> but I, but it makes it embedded into the images, so I love that very much. So I, yeah, so the tragic is like embedded formally within the way that Hal is using um, or referring back, you know, whether consciously or not, to the to the Zonders image into the tradition of ethnographic photography. Yeah, I love that actually. It's really helpful for me. Thank you. I'll also say one thing that about ethnographic images, this is just 
put this in, put this image up. I mean, almost every single one of Hal's images, ha like especially the street photo ones or street fashion ones, and many of them are centered in such a way that like the like the crotch is like right in the middle. So no matter how you come to it, you're like confronted with that. And I think that that could be made part of that interpretation of the of the ethnographic image and connecting it to Jewish humor somehow. But I'm I have a sense of the questions rumbling somewhere under the surface. Um, question from Peter Rayberg. Uh, thank you very much. I really liked how you are describing the pictures as avoiding the melancholic um, dimension of photography. And I think that's a very accurate um, observation. And I have to think about that more, what it means to the you know, what I was trying to make the connection to the present and yeah, how that yeah, is yeah. part of it. I have another question, um, and also reading it through the, uh, you know, economy of Jewish humor. And as we know, Sarah Kaufman makes this distinction between Roman and Jewish humor in the, her reading of Freud. And I was wondering, the other example that is prominent in Freud's, uh, the joke and its relation to the unconscious is, of course, the dirty joke, die Zote, which in a way would be, you know, one would think whether that is closer to the project, but I think it's maybe not. And you're, I think you might be completely correct in talking about the Jewish joke, but not about the dirty joke. But I was wondering whether you have any ideas about how Freud's idea of the dirty joke, which is the exposure of the female being castrated, how that somehow also helps us to read this specific gay humor. So, okay. so. Question and um, that I'm going to inadequately answer. Um, so, the way that I first got to humor was um, in part from a friend who, of mine who works on humor who brought up the dirty joke. And a lot of how I responded to this project in general was really just sort of like intuitively what I thought. <laughs> I don't like, I, I don't know, and I just kept thinking, oh, I don't, this, somehow that doesn't seem quite right to me. And it could be in part because I'm not. Um, operating from, like, I think I was, so f the second part of your question, what was the second part? Like, uh, the second part was like, how, how, how I, I, I was just curious whether the, um, the economy of the dirty joke, which is, if I remember correctly, somewhat different from the economy it of is, the Jewish, yeah. the, the dirty joke for Freud is not an example of Jewish humor, right? But it kind of, um, it opens up the way of thinking about the dirty joke also as a form of self-castration, or it, 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 it makes us think about, uh, based on the economy of the dirty joke, what is a feminist joke, what is gay humor. So I was wondering whether the sexually explicit contextualization of the joke that Freud himself is, um, is offering okay. somehow helps us also to situate this. Yeah, okay. So I'll just give it... Um, I don't see it, this project as explicit in that same kind of way, which is why it didn't seem appropriate. Yes. So that's like the short answer, yeah. yeah. Which okay. is why the video that you showed, I was like, this is making me crazy. And I wanted to actually ask Miriam, although I also think Tim's face at you was like, Terry is going to be shocked. You must turn this off right now. I totally took, it like whispered in my ear even. I was like, I can take it. I'm not that weak. But the, or genteel. There, there's like this. Um, but I, um, but I was curious when Miriam brought it up, like, because it's also super interesting. But so like I was curious, maybe this is a question for at the very end of the, the at the Q&A, like what you what you was left wanting for you and um, because there's a lot of other artists like Wendy Redstar who's an indigenous artist who has also taken the kind of um, and maybe I should have shown some of that who does the exact sign do you know that work who does the exact same kind of like Signification, but only on for um, indigenous clothing in some ways. So it's a contemporary use of the work, but in this like completely different way. Um, okay, I'm really going off the rails, so maybe that's. I, I just I just want to add that you 
you were ready to take it because you didn't know what was coming, and Peter stopped before you saw what was coming. <laughs> well, I'll just say sense. that. I'm gonna go home and watch it, of course. Like, there's like, that's like the only way. <laughs> I feel there are lots of comments or thoughts. I don't know if, Mariam, if you have a follow-up, you look like you might have a follow-up comment or question. Let me, Mariam Kashani. Thanks, and well, I mean, I think um, when, was it Peter who said, um, when he said generic, I was like, oh yes, that's a really good way to describe that video oh, yeah. because I think Hal's work does so much that is just not in that video. Um, and of course now listening to presentations, I'm like, oh, I kind of want to rewrite what I'm going to talk about <laughs> later. Um, but I think that it's just, and I think that point about the melancholy in the photos is so right on. And I kind of start with that a little bit, not using the term melancholy in my work, but the, the, the liveliness that's in the work and also even when you have a portrait of one person, there's a real sense of like the relational aspects that are like throughout your yes. work, right? And um, and sort of one of the thematics for me in, in the things that I'm gonna talk about later is like confrontation, but I and and but interaction also is really important and and the the ways that circumstances and the possibilities of interrelation that I find really like this reaching for that I kind of see at the same time as a kind of like observational um, that I appreciate. And of course, humor is intersubjective. I think that's good now. Okay. I just want to say, you know, it's the distinction between the dirty joke and the Jewish joke in Freud is a kind of specious Freudian distinction, right? And there's a way in which um, every joke is a dirty joke, right? Yeah. Um, but Although some people say that that's a misreading of Freud. Right, I, and you're, you're ent entirely entitled to correct my reading of Freud. No, no, no. I, I no, think it's a no, great no, moment. No, 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 that's not. <laughs> <laughs> that was just a highlight of the symposium for me. <laughs> Thank you. Please join me in thanking Terry Weissman. <laughs>